year and this is a special uh, weekend that we have we call it vision celebration in all of our services this weekend of the year because our church ministry and fiscal year goes from May 1 uh, till April 30 and we like to look back over the year and have a big God celebration here in our services uh, praising him for the things that he has done and making a renewed commitment to be more unified in our work together and I've seen you guys looking through the booklet a uh, whole lot of stuff in here to uh, give praise to God for and to find out more about what he's doing uh, throughout the uh, church. A lot of work has gone into this, so be sure to uh, take it home and spend more time in it. Uh, you have inside a couple of ballots, which are to affirm the new budget for the year, as well as seven uh, new elder or seven elder um, for renewed terms. And uh, those... Uh, those men are on page three, and then the budget is also on page 18. And we gave this to you a couple weeks ago in our uh, worship program. In fact, now would be a good time to fill that out so you don't forget, and you can put that into the offering basket at the end of the service. Also, a welcome card, because we are updating our church contact information. In one of the praises, we have a brand new church software system. It's going to help us in many, many ways. But not everybody got transferred over from the old. We're not sure why. Blame it on technology. Um, so if you could please let us know about your contact information. Fill this out today, and we can uh, have an accurate uh, database and correct contact information. We'd really appreciate that. And our Lifeline envelope today. Uh, boy, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, Lifeline envelope because uh, just a wonderful ministry to touch uh, those in our community and in our church who are going through some financial crisis. Today what we're going to be doing is um, a lot of praise reports, a number of videos. You're going to hear vision updates. Uh, we're going to have a challenge from the Word that I'm excited about in just a few minutes. Uh, we're going to start, and I guess really, I, I, I'm not going to read through it, but that page two, just all of the uh, things there, that's just a sampling of things just to give God praise for as we look uh, at, at, at what a great God he's, what he is and what he's done in our church over the last year. Um, but one thing I want to point out is what he has done at the two other campuses, the Redwood Campus and the New Hope Campus. Got a couple of videos we're going to show you on that. And uh, then right after that, I want to take a couple of minutes. We're going to pass two microphones around and we want to hear from you what is God doing in your life? What's the big thing that's happened over this last year? A major praise. You just want to give him praise for like in five seconds type thing. Uh, we'll be running those mics around in just a couple of minutes. Let's go ahead and check these videos out about Redwood and New Hope. Hey, we're here with Pastor Doug Higuera, campus pastor at the Redwood campus, Chuck Kostrana, who is a team uh, assistant uh, at that campus. 
And one of the exciting things this year has been the merger between uh, formerly Calvary Church and River Valley. Um, and it's exciting to see what's happening at River Valley Redwood. And Doug, why don't you walk us through that praise and how that happened this last year? I'd be glad to. Uh, toward the end of 2013, we had realized that uh, we were in need of a, a fresh vision. Uh, we were a, a church that had moved from downtown to a rural setting, and uh, we, we were just asking the Lord, uh, who are we, where are we? you've planted us, uh, with how you've resourced us and at this time. And so uh, about 10 of us or so were praying on Wednesday nights uh, for about 10 weeks. And uh, we uh, begin to talk with Mark and the staff here about uh, a work that they were looking at out there and started talking about a potential merger. It's been exciting. Yeah. What, what have been the most uh, thrilling things for you to see over this last year? Because the merger became official uh, January 1st. What's been the biggest praise? Well, there's no question that uh, the influx of, of new life in terms of uh, the home groups and the outreach, uh, the transformation of the sanctuary uh, to where we've improved our sound uh, and uh, video tremendously to where it's, it's much easier for people to hear and see, uh, the, uh, uh, just the partnership in the pulpit uh, and uh, the blessing of working with uh, this team here at River Valley. Really appreciated Chuck's role. You know, Chuck's so involved here in many ways at River Valley, but living uh, there in the community, being a partner uh, with Doug in the work, what are you seeing out there, Chuck? Well, I know first visiting there, let's see, about eight months ago, and uh, just uh, being part of the worship and seeing how from that point, uh, the, those that were there at the Redwood campus now have new life, as Doug has mentioned, uh, new families coming in. Uh, I see them coming to life in a sense. They've, they've really encouraged me. Uh, I know uh, talking with Doug and, and there's been some trials there, but they've persevered through those trials and now uh, they're coming out the other side and, and the Holy Spirit's moving and there's there's times of fellowship and laughter and uh, it's just it's just come to life. It's been really exciting and, and Doug himself as uh, you know working with him initially just seeing uh, the pressure on him and where he was and praying for that new vision and now that it's come out the other side it's He's got new life as well, even though he's old. You know, he's, he's got, he's good looking though, but he's got new life. And uh, it's just real exciting to be part of a new work like that, where we see the Holy Spirit really taking over through the prayer, through the seeking that they asked of him and seeing him saying, yes, here you go. Awesome. And, and coming up, wow, it's just a thrill. You've got this relationship now with Redwood School and what are you excited about there? Well, it's it's just fun to see their response. Uh, as as we've had a couple of uh, work days out there, we've we've uh, just the the principal and the head custodian there have been uh, thrilled with what they're seeing, and uh, we're looking forward to our serve GP day out there. And they've involved invited us to be a part of a, a community family fair day, um, and they want us to make a banner that says. Uh, River Valley uh, Redwood Church in Woo! partnership with Redwood Elementary. So yeah, they, they want us to lead with that. And uh, so, what, a, what a privilege yeah. to serve like that. And okay. this summer, we're going to be meeting in the amphitheater yes. every Sunday in their beautiful outdoor amphitheater. Praise God for that. Yes. That is a jaw dropper. Yes. It's really beautiful. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous campus. Yes. And, and we're seeing uh, a lot of young leaders. Uh, being developed and, and uh, futures looking bright out there. I just want to thank you for all you guys do. What a wonderful work God's uh, developing out there in the Redwood area. Thank you. Thanks for your leadership too, bud. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, we're here with Pastor Sean and Roger who give leadership out at the New Hope campus. Sean, the campus pastor, Roger on the staff helping out out there. I just appreciate you guys. Tell us what's happening out there in New Hope. Well, Mark, we're uh, meeting on Sunday mornings, and we're excited about the continual growth that we're seeing at the New Hope campus. Cool. Um, Roger and I were just talking about it uh, the other day, and 
I think within the last year we've seen at least a double, uh, not just attendance of people attending, but people that are really plugging in and assimilating in the ministry. Even at the home group level, uh, it's just sizzling. Awesome. And uh, home group is continuing to grow. Those are multiplying. Uh, we are engaged uh, in the neighborhood there with Madrona Elementary School. Right now we're committed to 10 weeks of soccer. Uh, Pastor Tyler Goins is helping us out uh, running the show there and uh, just getting to engage with parents as they're coming to pick up the kids. Another thing we're really excited about is that we've started a Monday night venue out at the Outback, which is behind Murphy Chapel. And on any given night, uh, Monday night, uh, we're seeing 20 to 25 guys and about eight to 10 women. And we're working the 12 steps of recovery with Celebrate Recovery, hurts, habits, and hangups, as well as addictions and that type of thing. And we're just seeing life transformation right before our eyes as Christ is changing our, our hearts and our minds. Cool. And Roger, I just appreciate your role. You know, you are on campus out there, you live out there. How's that working out uh, with the New Hope Ministry? Well, it's just exciting. Uh, obviously, the, the, the doors are open at this point for uh, for us youth guys to get on campus. And, and so I've been able to coach at both uh, Lincoln Savage and Hidden Valley. And that's just, that's just been awesome, building relationships with students. Sean and I obviously have been able to develop a really cool relationship. And, uh, you know, it, I, it's just been neat to be able to, to uh, work with these guys and, and um, you know, just give a little oversight, a little leadership. It's been a good time. Awesome. We're having a, it's been a good year. Well, there's a real buzz out in the New Hope community as we uh, praise God for this new work that's beginning to reach uh, the people of the New Hope in the Murphy area. Um, guys, thank you so much. We, we love you. Appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, Pastor Mike. Thanks. One of the things that's just been a huge blessing over this last year is the ministry to orphans uh, in Uganda uh, that God has blessed us with. And uh, check out this little video that promotes the sponsorship of the orphans, and then you're going to hear from our team uh, and Camille, who's here with us today. There are so many children in the world who have... Now, there are over 2,000 verses in the Bible about the poor. Anytime God says something 2,000 times, he's serious. I would say the number one thing is to see these young people, the children that we are taking care of, I would say the orphans, come to know the truth. Uh, as we help them get an education, we help them become healthy, we help them have a good home and maybe surrounding and things like that. Our number one goal each and every day that we wake up and ask the Lord is to soften the hearts of these people to get to know Him. So it is our responsibility to love them because those children, they need a lot of love. We want to look at each one, see what their gifts and talents are, try to help them do what they like, and um, build them up so that they can support a family, uh, be in a, a nice community. We really need prayers so much because there are many people who are suffering in our area. Many need their kids, many kids who are suffering who need education. They need the sanitation, they need actually to be trained, they need a lot of kind of help. So much. So much hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to do kingdom work, you must care about children. Sympathy is saying, I'm sorry you hurt. And that's about as far as most people go. They see something on TV about orphans and they go, man, that's sad. I'm sorry you hurt. Sympathy. Empathy says, I hurt with you. That's a deeper level. But compassion says, I will do everything I can to stop your hurt. I will do whatever I can to stop your hurt. And the Bible says repeatedly, Jesus was moved with compassion. I want to be like Jesus.
When you look at an orphan, you need to see them not as simply a victim, but you need to see them as a future world leader. God gives special blessings to the orphans, and God gives special blessings to the people who care for orphans. About 23 years ago, um, Bob and Camille Hadlock began their work um, with Teen Missions, and for um, many of those years, uh, they spent their time in Uganda. Um, we began to, uh, began to have a closer relationship with Camille, even though she'd been a missionary with us for quite a long time. When um, we started our first um, rescue unit up in Kaboko, we wanted to do a work, and we partnered with Teen Missions, and we wanted to do a work special, and, um, and began that. Um, things changed quickly from there. Why don't you share that with us a little, Camille? Well, the Lord sort of um, took me from one ministry and put me in another ministry under this church to basically do... Um, uh, hands-on ministry with orphans, where as before I was more administrative and um, overseeing a lot of things. Now I get to be right in the in the hands-on part with the orphans and their guardians and doing those things. So it's uh, very enjoyable and a wonderful opportunity for me. One of the things you'll see in the front back of the chairs are more packets for orphans. Mm -hmm. We have about 650 kids right now that are sponsored, that are able to go to school and have an education, but we still have more that aren't sponsored. So we would encourage you, if you have not done that yet, to pick up a packet and fill it out. You can do it also online, or you can do it by check in the mail. But if you are currently uh, sponsoring an orphan and you have not changed over to the new software, Pastor Mark talked about that, you need to do that so you can call the front office and talk to Cheryl McCarty or myself, and we'll walk you through that. Um, so $15, Camille, what will $15 a month do for these orphan kids? Well, it's pretty amazing. You won't really believe all that we can do in Uganda with that money. But um, it not only provides education and the things you've already heard, um, food when they need it, medicines, blankets, um, practical things like mosquito nets and just basic needs that they have, toothpaste, toothbrushes even, those kind of things, but um, it provides staff who can be there for them, to counsel them, to love them, to support them as a parent should, even if they, they stay with an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or very elderly grandparents, uh, a brother. Um, they don't normally get real loving care and a lot of attention. Uh, their life is mostly work and go to school, work, go to school. And um, so we try to provide some extra things and then actually the government wants us to do things like provide even um, opportunities for athletics and for fun and for physical um, activity as well as um, emotional and um, so they call it psychosocial uh, help so all of those kind of things come along and our newest thing that I'm excited about is being able to provide technical training for some of the kids who um, have finished their schooling and um, don't know exactly what they want to do, but we can have them learn tailoring, which is sewing, and um, then at the end of that class, they can get a sewing machine and begin doing their own ministry, uh, uh, not ministry, business, so that if they become widows someday, they won't be devastated, but they'll have at least something they can do, and then some guys are doing carpentry, we have mechanics that they can do, and many other things that almost anything you can imagine they need there. So before we uh, let Tom share another exciting event that has occurred over in Uganda, if you are interested in going over, uh, we are going in July, uh, but it's a small team. And so we don't want to discourage you. We will be trying to plan another trip in February. So we're giving advance notice. We're looking at February to take another team over to be with the orphans and to see the new things that are going on. Um, so we're excited about that. You also have an opportunity to write letters to your orphan. Um, it's an amazing thing for a child to receive a handwritten letter, a piece of paper that's written to them. It's special. And you have an opportunity to do that. We'll hand deliver those. Um, so be praying about that. Mm 
And if having 1,200 orphans wasn't a large enough responsibility, um, and also recognizing that there are thousands that would like to be a part of our program, um, about a year ago, we got asked by Teen Missions if we'd be willing to take over um, their secondary school, which we decided to do. And so now, not only do we have the number of campuses here in Grants Pass, we have <laughs> Hopeland in Caboco, and we have, we've named it Sunshine um, Secondary School um, in Iganga, near, near Iganga. We have right now 350 high school students that there are, these are our kids. This is our school. And, and we are caring for these kids. I, I'm just thinking, you know, mm -hmm. quickly, we started with Camille uh, several years ago as a single staff person. We have a staff of 50 people now supporting orphan kids in, the, in this field. And it really is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot of support. We'll, we'll be telling you about that in the months to come in terms of things, that, you know, that we can do to help over there. But God just makes things a whole lot bigger, doesn't he, when, we, um, when we're committed to him. Thanks, guys. Hi, my name is Michael Bond. I'm the pastor of worship and administration at River Valley Church. I wanted to spend a couple minutes and give you a facility update. In fact, I actually want to talk to you about our bowling alley facility. And actually, yes, we own a bowling alley. Praise God that escrow is closed, and where I sit right now is actually ours. You might ask, why do we have a bowling alley? Well, in past years, as our leadership team has prayed about how God would want us to move forward and grow and reach out to the community, we've noticed that we're very landlocked downtown and we need new space. Well, God opened up a very exciting moment for us to get literally tens of thousands of square feet that we can convert into worship space, actually into another campus. So right now we're talking with architects, with designers, different consultants trying to gain wisdom and insight so we can move forward the best way possible. Once this campus opens up, we're still gonna have services downtown because that's so important to us, but we'd love to alleviate some of the pressure, some of the congestion that we face on Sunday mornings. And if you attend one of those services, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We only have 15 minutes between our services so sometimes to find a parking space, get your kids to a class, get your coffee, get into the service can be quite a challenge. So we'd like to open up that space and give you more time. So what we'd probably do is split the services between our downtown facility and the bowling alley. That would not only alleviate some of that pressure, but it would also support some of our values at River Valley, which is community, connection, and relationship. We wanna separate out the services, give it more time so you have that time to be with one another. So it's very exciting. So as we move forward with that, another thing that you probably wanna know is what are we gonna do with our Scoville Road property? Well, we're gonna put that up for sale. And so right now we're praying for the right buyer because we could use the capital from that sale to fund the remodel and the reconditioning of our bowling alley site. So please in the days ahead, be praying for us, for the right decisions to be made and for God to lead every step that we take together. Thank you so much for listening to this update. Hey guys, Dwayne Stark here coming to you from Salem. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but wanted to just send a little note and encourage you guys to start thinking about Serve GP, something that we're going to do this year that we are wondering why we hadn't done in years past, is that we're going to do a tighter link between Serve GP Service Day and Church in the Park. And this year we're going to come out and we're going to serve and celebrate. So we will serve on Saturday, June 27th, and then we'll all get together on Sunday, June 28th, and celebrate what God is doing in our community. Uh, serve GP this year, we could still use some more project managers, and by the end of this next week, you should be able to sign up online to serve as individuals, so make sure you're paying attention, and if you want to help run a project, let me know ASAP. As far as the celebrate part, we have an evangelist named Jose out of Portland that we're really excited. He's going to come out. He's done a lot of community outreach over the years, and we've been working with him on ways that we can take it from more than just church in the park and have a huge celebration on Sunday afternoon in the park as we invite people to come out, celebrate Jesus and what he's done in our community. So coming up, serve and celebrate. Uh, June 27th and 28th, we want to see you there. Start paying attention, watch for the announcements, and get involved. Lots of stuff to be excited about and to give praise to God for. And I want to share a couple things on my heart. 
um, that ties into this vision celebration today from the Word. You know, we've been in this series, Flip This Community, and How to Make This Community a Better Place. The title that I want to uh, talk about today in the short study that we have is Flipping This Church. And if we have any time at the end, I'd love to answer some questions. If you want to text them in uh, or talk to me afterwards, we can do that. Most people, when it comes to church, well, they basically see it as a place to get their needs met. It's a place that they go to for spiritual growth um, and encouragement. In fact, the number one answer you typically hear when somebody is asked, why do you go to that church, is you know, something like, well, that church meets my needs. That church is helping me grow. That church is a place I like. That's where I'm getting fed. And surely these are good answers. Obviously, River Valley wants to meet needs. We want to help feed you. Uh, we want this to be a place that benefits you uh, in your faith. But here's the challenge that I want to share. Very, very important today. If our number one motive and number one reason for the church is a sense of personal benefit, um, a church for the sake of you, just call it that, a church for you, well, God's heart is that we flip that, okay? We flip that, and, and so the big idea, we're going to flip the order, and that in order to flip this community, we got to flip the church, and, and, and this is going to, or, or the purpose of the church, I should say, and this is going to include flipping three important priorities. we got to get them in the right order. And so here's the correct order. We're going to take, we're going to take what's typically number one, and we're going to make it number three. All right? And what we're going to do is we're going to say the church, more than anything else, is for God's sake. The church is for the sake of God. Now, I know that might sound strange. It's like, well, of course. Well, it's a sad reality. How many churches and even Christians miss this simple truth? They miss the main point that we're here because of God and what he thinks and what he wants and what he's doing in our life and in our community, in our families. We should be most concerned about what gives him pleasure, what makes him look good. A few years ago, I did this illustration in a message where I started giving the message, but nobody knew where I was. And I was actually in a refrigerator box that was kind of back here, and it was painted black, and it had some greenery that was hiding, you know, disguising it. And then I came out. And, but the whole point was an illustration. All I could see was up. I said, you know, that's, a, that's an illustration we need to remember that the, that the most important uh, person here is the Lord. It's his eyes. It's what he is seeing. It's so easy to get caught up in all the stuff that's going on. Not that that's bad, but we need to be most concerned about God. Like, like we typically have a big idea every week, but he is the big idea. It has to be him. Because the church is the body of Christ, he's the head, the church is the dwelling of God, it's his church. Sometimes people say, well, you know, the church is not a building, it's the people. That's partly true. It's the dwelling for God. It's his church. Psalm 42, 1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? It's like that commercial, I think it was a car commercial a few years back, where they, they drive in this car all the way across the country, and they get out at the Grand Canyon, take a picture, get in their car, and leave. What do I think of that? Insane. You're going to go to the Grand Canyon, stay there, hang out, take it in, hike around, whatever. You don't just take a Snapchat, you know, and then leave. But we can do that with God. We even come in here and it's like we're not really seeing him. We're not really so much gazing on the Lord. We should be here to see God, to get a good look at him. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It's all for him. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And so, you know, it is easy to miss this. It's easy to live more of like a me-centered kind of Christianity, a me-centered life. 
versus a God-centered life. We've, we talk about this occasionally because it's an important distinction. What's the difference? Well, me-centered Christianity, me-centered life, is God is a means to an end. The main purpose and benefit of God is for me. That's me-centered thinking. Where God-centered Christianity, God-centered living, is that God is the end. That the main purpose is to bring the most pleasure and glory to God. Now, it's easy for us to struggle with this for a couple of reasons. First, we're naturally self-centered. And second, there's a lot of Bible verses that talk about personal benefit of being a Christian. It's good, man. There's no better decision. It's no better life than the Christian life. It's hard, but there's no better life, right? But the thing is, it's still easy to miss the point and to think that it's about us more than God. I call it cat-dog theology, right? Where the dog says, you feed me, you love me, you pet me, you care for me, you must be God. But the cat says, you feed me, you love me, you pet me, you care for me, I must be God. And it's easy in our faith to do that, to start thinking, wow, the, the, I'm the point. It kind of all revolves around me. Martin Luther said it this way, the essence of sin is that man seeks his own in everything, even in God. It's true. We can easily be self-serving, even in our faith. So we have to ask the question, what really is at the center? Okay, why am I a Christian? Why am I in church? Well, I don't want to go to hell. It's a good answer. Uh, I want a better life. Good answer. I want to be a better person. Good answer. But none of those are at the center. What's at the center is because we want to make much of God. We want God to be so much more famous in this world through our lives. So we're going to be about a church for God's sake. The second thing, more than a church for the sake of you or me, we're going to be a church for the sake of others. Because the predominant mindset when it comes to church with both insiders and especially the outsiders is that it's primarily a place for the members, a program for the members, you know, kind of like a club, meetings for the members, staff serves the members, and outsiders especially think, that the church is for church people. Because inside, well, there's kind of insider behavior, insider etiquette, meetings, you know, secret meetings, different vocabulary. We use words like grace, obviously a great word. But I mean, the average person outside the church, grace, that's what Uncle Harry does Thanksgiving dinner, right? And amazing grace, that's an amazing prayer by Uncle Harry at the Thanksgiving dinner. And, and so it, it's easy for us to, to miss the fact that, that we, we need to be a church for the sake of others. What is Jesus most interested in? The lost or the found? The lost. Now, he loves the found. He loves us as Christians, obviously. Of course, but he's on a mission to seek and save the lost. He's called the friend of sinners. That's always the heart of Jesus. Now, someone might object Wait, isn't the church for Christians? Well, of course it is. But think with me. It's more accurate to say the church is not primarily for us. The church is us. We exist for the sake of others. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, Come follow me, and I will make you good church attenders. <laughs> oh, no, that's not right, is it? No, I'll make you fishers of men, a church for the sake of others. And I got to tell you, I get concerned when, when I hear folks, uh, you know, well-meaning folks who say about River Valley, I finally found a church where I'm comfortable. I am finally, finally found a church that meets my needs. And I'm like, well, that's okay, but that's actually reason number three. Yes, we have our needs met, but for What? Well, Ephesians 4 says, built up to serve. Needs met to serve. Bill Thraw, in his book, True Face, says this, God's dreams for you are ultimately not really about you. Oh, don't misunderstand. They'll bring you some of the best days of your life. You'll be fulfilled beyond any imaginable expectations, 
But God's dreams take form only when they're about others, for the benefit of others, loving them, guiding them, serving them, influencing them. There are no other types of God dreams. So as a church, we're trying to spread a net, a net of forgiveness, a net of healing, a net of family to catch as many people as possible. That's our dream. It's a great dream because it's God's dream and it's for the sake of others. Carl Manager, one of the uh, most renowned psychiatrists who ever lived, he was asked one time, what do you tell someone if they're about to have a nervous breakdown? Here's what he said. Lock up your house, go across the railroad tracks, find someone in need, and do something to help that person. I really like that. Lock up your house, okay? Get out of yourself. Go help somebody. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 and 33, nobody should seek his own good, Paul says, but the good of others. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And so the implications for us here on this Vision Celebration Weekend is that you know, we're not just receivers, we must be givers, that we get to serve within the church and outside the church, and with kids, with students, with those going through recovery issues, all kinds of outreach opportunities within and without, like what we see happening in our church and what we desire to grow in. It's just amazing, and not just in the church, but in the world and with all the missionaries that we support, and the Uganda kids, as Sarah just, and Tom and Camille challenged us to be involved. I mean, we can't help every orphan in Africa. Of course we can't, but we can help some, and we can all do our part, and that's the idea. And here's a church. It's about reaching those who aren't here yet. I, I mean, we were estimating that on Easter weekend, there were probably close to 3,000 people in a river valley, like in one of the three churches and all the services that took place. And, and most of those folks are river valley people. I mean, there are some new people that come on Easter, but pretty much the Easter attendance is when everybody in your church comes on that weekend. That's, you know, if they're in town, you got to come on Easter, you know, you, you can go to hell if you don't, uh, you know, come on Easter type thing. <laughs> just joking, just joking. Um, well, we were talking as a staff about that and, and just so filled with praise about what God's doing. But, but an important question is, how do we reach the next 3,000? Like, it's wonderful to have this many, but how do we reach? The, it's like, oh, you know, we're done. We're done. We got big enough. <laughs> we're going to stop growing. We're going to stop reaching, you know, new campuses, new work. And that's the whole reason that we're doing this. It's like, Michael was talking to us about the bowling alley. Like, we're not doing that for us. I mean, even for, for crowding and space here, I mean, there's, there's some, I guess there's something to be said about that. But ultimately, we don't need that for us. Like, we'll make it work here. We found a parking place today. You, you know, we found a place to come in and sit. It's not ultimately for us. It's for those who aren't here and what we believe God wants to do through us. It's like if you have a little home group of eight or 12, we should always be asking, how do we reach the next eight? How do we reach the next 12? It's always about the, not just those who are there, but those who aren't there. And it's also why things happen, you know, uh, staff help out at different facilities. And like Doug was saying in the video, we're going to be more team-based. And it's just, it's a little outside the box of what we typically have experienced with church. But it's a really fun time. We're learning as we go. And we need a lot of prayer support. We need a lot of people to step up and to help with different holes that emerge because of what's going on. But it's really exciting. So a church for God's sake, a church for others' sake, and of course, number three, a church for you. Of course. Because, you know, God is so concerned that we have incredible joy, that he wants us to have incredible life. John 10, 10, the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, there's no contradiction between number three and number one and two. You might say, well, you know, finally, it's now about me. <laughs> no, there's no contradiction at all. Because the 
life that's off the charts with joy and happiness is when it comes through making much of God and being completely happy and full of joy in God. We read in Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 102, serve the Lord with gladness. 37.4, delight yourself in the Lord. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Those last three verses, I don't know if you ever saw this, joy is a command. To be happy in God is a command. Because if we're not happy in God, it means that we're trying to find happiness somewhere else. And that stuff just doesn't satisfy. If you haven't learned yet, this world doesn't, could be good stuff, but it's going to let you down. It comes and goes. The Lord is the only one who gives life. He's the only one who's worth our lives. He's the only one who's true love. He's the only one who's always there, sticks closer than a brother. It's the Lord, man. Your search is over, and he's the only one who's the rock. Don't build on anything else than the Lord Jesus. I love this Nehemiah 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I'm fighting for your joy. I want you to have off the charts joy that the world can't ever take away. But that's going to come through putting the Lord first in this church. It's going to be come through putting others second and then ourselves. And that's how it all works. So God, we praise you. I pray that none of us here would waste our lives, that we would not waste our lives, that we would get involved in different ways if we're not yet to serve you. And we thank you so much for what you're doing. We thank you for the church family, for the sacrifice, the financial sacrifices, the sacrifice of time, tears, energy. Lord, it's awesome. Thanks for all the groups. Lord, thanks for all the stuff we don't even know about that happens every single day. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.